And so we have to think about this. So what type of stations are we going to have? What's the role of each one of these stations in these communities? How does it fit in the region? Does this provide a chance? Basis. So how do you implement this? How do you connect it to community? What's our natural resource setting or agricultural setting? So if you're a landscape architecture student, what's the ecology of each site? How do you start to think about this in a net gain perspective? If you're an urban planner, how do you start to think about regional policies in terms of population distribution and supporting it with other types of transit intersections? If you're an architect or urban designer, what types of addresses and places are you curating and what opportunities for that do you have in a, in a transit-oriented community? So let's talk about types of stations. You have these sort of regional metro center stations. So you have the alpha stations and you've got some stations that are like along the interstate. Those may be drive-to stations. People may drive there and then take the train in. Okay, so this is sort of a park and ride concept. You have local stations that start to support that. Well, in downtown Indy, I just had a chance to meet with a, a master's urban design studio looking at this, at this area. And so uh, Scott Truex and I uh, worked on, on this in 2003 as part of the uh, UDAT South for, uh, for the Metro Center planning in Indianapolis. So this is one of the schemes that looked at this. I did this very quick sort of hand-drawn plan diagram, then thought about how transit would transform this area in, term, in terms of, of the planning. And so we looked at intersection with local transit, parking and uh, uh, trolley circulation, pedestrian connections, links to the freeway, thinking about the types of mixed use stuff that might happen. There's a chance, a one-off chance in the whole state to really build a proper transit hub that would rival Chicago and other Midwestern transit hubs. And we started by putting a suburban football stadium and a sea of parking next to the stadium. That's aspirational, okay? Only thing you can say about the parking, it's a really great interim use. Well, if only they didn't put the, the, the stadium in sideways, okay? So again, if we're really going if we're serious about this, we need to really connect, you know, when we start thinking about our urban, urban design solutions uh, for a station like this. There's no other opportunity in the state of Indiana and maybe the Midwest if you're really going to do this as you'd have uh, around the train station. Now, let's talk about some of the other ones here. That's a one-off. That, that takes a lot more thinking that apparently is going on in Indy right now about that site. So let's come back to the density discussion. So you know, I'm willing to guess in Indiana when you every time you pave a cornfield, you're developing around four units an acre gross. And so it's four units in every acre of corn you're taking down, all right? That is not a sus transit sustainable density. That's like, that's the 42 acre ecological footprint model, right? And so when you look at different neighborhood types, and even if they have transit, you plan them so they have a central focus. But what you're starting to see is more of actually townhouse densities. And in this market, that's probably a feasible discussion. But townhouses come in all flavors. Like I like this one in the middle left. Those are in Denver, really edgy, three-story loft. You can do a live work thing off the ground floor. Pretty cool urban building type. And you got some other stuff that look, you know, colonial or whatever. And, uh, and so you've got some other, and so, but it's a very flexible type of building. That's probably central Indiana's high density prototype for a long time. And so how do you start to think about neighborhood planning at that scale? And so that's something that we need to think about. Density trends are changing a little bit. There's reasons for that. You like that t-shirt? I gotta track that down. So land, prices of land is going up. So Developers are under pressure to get a higher yield out of the, you know, they want more units uh, per acre, changing housing needs and demographics, 
We have old, sort of old style community plans. People are now starting to ask the density question and some of these other things, so they're starting to deal with that. We, we will have, I mean, if we didn't subsidize gas, it would be 12 bucks, right? But we, we subsidize the petroleum industry a trillion freaking dollars a year. And I'm, I'd really like them to just carve off a few billion of that and retrofit the Midwest in terms of our next economy here. Make this, make this where the new energy economy is coming from. Just take a little bit of that back and, and, and reposition the central part of the country. But $10 gas, regardless of that, when it's, when it's cost $22 to, to produce and we only subsidize it so much, we'll, we'll still have to pay 10 And there's a relationship piece. The Midwest is terrible about city, county, and township, township relationships. I'm from central Michigan. Generally speaking, Michigan has the same population it had in 1900. And, it, and we have hollow cities. I'm from Jackson, Michigan. Well, I was Tony Dungy's classmate, actually. I grew up with Tony Dungy and ran track with him. My dad coached him. We're from a small factory town, Jackson, which was 50,000 people, now 36,000 people. When I was in Muncie, it was 88,000 people, now 64,000. We're not growing the state. We're growing our appetite for farmland. So we have, a very, we have an ex-urban pattern. But some of that's going to start turning back, and it has to be done both the, our environment and economy is going to start turning it back. But we need policies to start to support that. Let's walk through some of these stations and get and to just, and this was just to get an attitude about, just to give us a sense for how we start to think uh, about this. So go back to this map here for a minute. So we have a string of stations. We have nine stations. So I'm, uh, we, we've already done Indy. That's a one-off. We're going to walk through Lawrence, McCordsville, Fortville, Fortville, Pendleton, Anderson, Daleville, Yorktown, and Muncie. We're going to walk, walk through some of these. So Lawrence Station area. Some of these stations, there's some very important big decisions to be made about where you place a station. So a station like this needs about 800 to 1,000 feet of platform. You cannot build a platform on a curve. All right? You've got curve track off the table. This is, in fact, downtown Pendleton. That's going to be a discussion. And so in Lawrence, this is, that's 465. Could be a park and ride station. This might be a station people would actually park. So where would you put a park and ride facility? There's some sort of quite vacant, shaggy industrial areas. See this land, these land use colors? And then you've got sort of the sort of traditional downtown Lawrence, which is a hot rock in place. I can just see that. And so how do you do infill? What sort of new investment patterns are you creating with each station? So some key questions for this. It's location type of station. Is this a greenfield station or an infill station? Park and ride. How do you inspire infill to revitalize these little communities and, and uh, prop them up? And remember that density discussion? That's the square mile. How do you get 10,000 people in every yellow box I'm going to show you? How do you do that? That's your goal. That's a whole community. That supports a grocery store, three elementary schools, and 25 to 50 acres of parkland, okay, depending how urbane you're going to be with it. So that's the, that's the program. So how do you do that? Well, you can see here you're going to have to do both. You're going to have to really think very carefully about your new development and your infill, right? Here in McCordsville, and uh, you can see they have sort of this little traditional, and here there's an opportunity to sort of build from that. So you you can center the station, sort of jumpstart reinvestment in McCordsville. I've never been to McCordsville. To, we used to go out and look for the, the country bars in the 70s. They must not have had a good one or I would have been there. And so I've never been there. But I just looking at this, I'm thinking, you know, you have a chance to jumpstart what's there and also start thinking about the edges. And look what's coming from the left. Look at what's growing their way. All right? What's that? That's that 42-acre footprint, right, per, per capita footprint coming this way. So here's a chance to start thinking a little bit 
So how do you get 10,000 people in that box? How about Fortville, famous Fortville? I have no idea where your property is. I, Main Street. Well, you're in good, because we put the station there in my make-believe plan for... Oh, oh okay. Well, congratulations. I, I think they're singing rock songs about that. So, um, so if you look at uh, Fortville, so you have a chance to really jumpstart this, this Main Street community, and you can start, again, developing at the edges. You start leaning uh, your higher density development that way and start thinking about, about infill. But getting 10,000 people in that, if you have to go back and count who's there now, may actually be harder than in greenfield development. So it's going to be a much more surgical approach in terms of how do you approach it. Pendleton, so there's some, uh, there's some studios that are working on this. Actually, Steve and I uh, over breakfast are talking about this. So I think there's a big question with this area, whether or not you build a downtown station or you build a greenfield station. Because when you look closely at the downtown, there's not a lot of available land because they built like all this big box strip stuff on the other side of the, of the railroad tracks next to downtown. So it doesn't really lend itself to housing at this point. And so and then the, you have railroad tracks apparently elevated in this area as well. So a Greenfield station, think about that mile square. If you head south or north, you got a lot of real estate to work with, right? And you could even expand. You could make that larger. There's plenty of space there. But what does that do to the traditional town center? Some value judgments to be made, huh? What we value in our community? Is this just train-oriented greenfield sprawl? This is, a, this is a value question you have to start considering. Downtown, if you start creating some high-density development close to the train station, you've got to go for it. And the stuff you build at the edges needs a really deliberate connection to downtown. Okay, and so how do you really market it as a, as a transit-oriented address? These are the big decisions. You've got to get 10,000 people in that box. Now, poor downtown Anderson and Muncie, these are actually the hardest. It wouldn't be in, in some places in the country, but these are, these are quite challenging. So you start to thinking about, you, these are these sort of the traditional core areas. And so they have to be multimodal. You want to get all the transit intersecting there. You have to think about how you start to focus cultural activities and everything you can with the station. You leverage everything in a downtown. And then you just go about doing as much edgy townhouse and conversion as you can market in that narrow band and just work really hard at creating the address. And we have Ball State, at least, uh, you know, in Muncie, so we've got at least some cultural and larger uh, things to build on. Now, you look at downtown Anderson. Not as much industry compared to Muncie, so you don't have as much brownfield discussions you might in downtown Muncie. So Daleville, so again, there's a lot of, uh, this is a hybrid opportunity to build on the traditional downtown and some greenfield development next to it, provide some commercial focus. Yorktown, where's Main Street on Yorktown? You've been through there lately, they're doing all the Main Street stuff on, on 32. What does a project like this do to Main Street? Does it create two communities, different sides of the railroad track? Sort of the American story, right? So you have to be very careful about balancing investment in these communities. And there's some more land out there that if you start to think about getting 10,000 people and Muncie. But you look at, look at all the factories and stuff that are contiguous to downtown. History of Muncie was all these south side neighborhoods, these working class neighborhoods. There's actually a neighborhood called the industrial neighborhood in Muncie. And so the connections between workplace and transit and factories is a very important one in, in Muncie. So how do you start to think about those connections in the new economy uh, as well? So wish us luck getting 10,000 people in the yellow box. We're going to have to create a really compelling story for that. So let's add it up. All right, so what have we done? Just based on my back envelope calculations, we've created 10,000 jobs and we're housing uh, we have, say it's 20, keep it round numbers because I'm not a great actuary here. So 20,000 units of housing, 
So 50,000 people in the trans, and we haven't talked about the, all the other hub opportunities really of what we could do besides the parking lot, you know, next to the train station and downtown. You could almost double that if you go back and really look at a vibrant downtown Indianapolis. So let's go back to our scorecard. What's, the, what's our Hummer equivalent on what we've just done? All right. So at the 42-acre footprint, we've created on an annual basis, if we just develop at the, that sort of sprawl density, the equivalent of adding 270,000 Hummers to the road every year. We've done that on one transit corridor in central Indiana. If you look at the 12-acre footprint, it's 77,000, which is still mind-boggling, but the difference is 190,000 less. And what that means, that's two years' worth of annual sales for Hummers in the United States. One transit corridor in central Indiana, we just, we just mitigated a bunch of, a bunch of, of uh, people that are compensating for something, driving a Hummer. All right. Well, how do we make it happen? This is the other, the other part of the story uh, here. So how do we make this happen? So regional cooperation. You can't talk about regional planning without thinking about how everybody plays together. You have to fund this. Our, this is all upstream. We cannot fund the stuff that we're talking about under the current approach. Ain't happening. It takes a whole new attitude about how we do development assessment, how we have capital expenditures at the state level, and a number of other things. It's just not happening. And how do we plan for it? What's the regulatory approaches? I wouldn't start thinking about, I wouldn't quite yet think about, about form-based codes. I think we're a little premature on that. I think there's a, a few hundred questions in front of that, okay, that we need to deal with. So this is a challenge for us. And this is not just a challenge in Indiana, but a lot of states and regions are wrestling with this. So we think about economic wealth in the region. That's our paychecks. That's providing economic mobility. That's our standard of living. And we think of fiscal health. We think about you know, our tax receipts, sales tax, and property taxes in our communities. And that really supports our public services and our community amenities and funds our education in our communities. And we often think about these regional issues as being separate from our local quality of life and how we fund our and we can't do that. A competitive region needs both. You have to consider your economic health and your fiscal health as a co-investment in your future. And we've got to get over this. None of this is going to happen if we can't get over this discussion about even if we're going to, if we were going to fund education in this state. The knowledge worker will not stay in Indiana. They're the most mobile. They can make a quality of life choice. And if we don't invest our way out of it, it ain't happening. We have to think about it at a statewide level and a regional level and a local level. We fund stuff now. We think about our urban patterns. How do you like that Google Earth shot of Highway 69? That's the 6945 intersection. Look at the housing just crawling up the freeway. That's what we're doing. In the 70s, when I was here with a bad haircut and platform shoes, that was all corn. That, was not, that wasn't all these, all these suburbs. And that happens because we fund our, we think about where the jobs go, we talk about that's where the housing goes, and then the housing creates the land, the land builds the roads, and then we fund the roads with that development. And then there's the real estate industry that's always gaming on uh, speculative ventures, and they buy votes, and voila, 42-acre footprints. That's old-school nexus for funding. That is bad. We're going to only get the same unless we, this is really fundamental. So if you're an urban planning student, and you're not talking about this in some of your classes, how to implement policy, you got a set of values, you got a set of policies, and we don't fund it. We're actually not voting in our best interest. Uh, and so we need to get real about some of that. And so the type of investment, that's Fishers, OK, in the bottom slide. Where's that slide on the top? It could be freaking anywhere, because that's a standard in the Civil Engineering Handbook. So our public domain 
has been turned over to the civil engineers and so we get sound walls and humming green boxes for our public domain. Pretty exciting, huh? And so that's what's happening. So we now to take that back, we have to fund it differently. And so this, instead of having infill development subsidizing sprawl, which is what we do in Indiana, so when you look at development fees, and you, you don't scale it, so the, the nexus for investment, a house, infill house, has to pay the same fee as a new greenfield house, even though it's built on existing, existing infrastructure. And so the money they don't spend actually goes to pay for sprawl. And so, well, and then plus, if you're doing infill, you may actually have to fix some 100-year-old infrastructure, so you pay twice. So you're, so you're punishing smart growth. And so what you need to start thinking on a regional basis, to start looking at regional impact fees to start to support infrastructure reinvestment that gets you back to a smart growth pattern and back to infill and back to transit. And nothing will happen in Indiana unless you get to that point. So the whole debate in the legislature, whether it's in Michigan or Indiana or California or New Jersey, is DOA without backing up and thinking about are we even funding our values as communities. And maybe we are for 45th in terms of, uh, you know, our ranking nationally in terms of people who are educated and stay here or go here. There's advocacy funding. You use this for seed money. So you can start to get at some of this discussion. And, uh, and so what funds above versus what's below in the picture, you know, that's something that is that's an armature discussion for growth. So <clears throat> a couple, uh, about a month ago, I was a guest speaker at Caltrans, which is the highway department in California. And I've been ranting for the last year about Caltrans mission should not be building lanes for cars and trucks. Their mission should be all about moving goods and people. Very different attitude about infrastructure when you start thinking that way. But it's not in the manual. They're just, they're just melting down. Okay? So this is something we have to start thinking at a legislative level to get at that. And it goes beyond that. So the landscape architects I work with, we work really hard on green streets and other things. So there's this thing I've put together in some of my strip commercial districts called, I've been calling a smart street concept. So it's more than transportation. You have environmental sources. You think about water quality. You can think about community, how you make a contribution to community. There's an economic development dimension to this. Every transportation investment should happen in this type of context, this type of discussion. So it's not just adding lanes to the highway to support the Hummer crowd. Okay, this is not what it's about. And so when we think about how we invest in this. So I actually did this diagram to, to present to the uh, cabinet level person in the Schwarzenegger administration about Caltrans. And so, uh, and this basically showed Highway 99, which is the main street for the Central Valley, which I'm working on a regional plan for right now. We're trying to figure out how to house the next 3.6 million people. And to think about this, not just, because we could build 12 lane highway and it's still gonna fill it up. They say, what happens if we start thinking about that corridor differently? And we're thinking about parallel transit, the use of our rail corridors. We think about a much broader definition of what, what a corridor is. And Caltrans shifts its mission to moving goods and people instead of building, building lanes, which just degrade air quality in the second worst air basin in America. But we're, so far, we're, we're using Riverside, uh, San Bernardino, uh, as our development mentor because they have the worst air quality in America. And so there's direct connections between these types of decisions, including land use. You couldn't have a land use pattern like this without considering the land use and the transportation at the same time. So how the places you go, you've been to Portland, the places that you go and you can think of, you know, they had to do this. You just can't talk about transit without talking about some of these other, what might be some uncomfortable thinking. So if you're, if you're a, go to traffic engineering school, you're a civil engineer with a traffic engineering specialty, this is the standard model for transportation, traffic engineering. 
And so land use, travel generation factors, impedance factors, friction, this is all stuff that just makes your mind go numb. But basically, that's input into the model. And based on that, they start thinking about how to deal with assigning trips. Land use isn't even in the model. It's an input because that's already been handed to them. It needs to be part of the model. This is so fundamental and so basic that one of our peer industries and professions is not there with us on this. They just, they melt down when you try to talk about this stuff. And so we need to be leaders on this discussion. We have to take back the public domain from the humming green boxes and the sound wall crew. So, all right, another piece. I just put in a couple slides about not form-based codes, but about rewarding good behavior. So that's what, that's what planning and zoning is really all about. You have to def tell people what good behavior is, then you have to reward it. So if you're not clear on your vision, you can't articulate your policies about the future, you can't provide direction, and therefore zoning and all that is just an entitlement exercise done by real estate speculators and attorneys. So let's think about this. So this is a rail yards project I worked on in California. The top diagram is the zoning envelope. Zoning is a quantitative, measurable device the cities use, and it meant nothing until we added the qualitative directions to it, which is what happens to that envelope on the bottom. That's what the guidelines do to it. So we need both. We have to think about that. So how much and what type of places we're creating with it. Form-based codes, don't drink the Kool-Aid. So people are going to come in and sell form-based codes like the snake oil, all right? It's just another tool in the kit. So I may be working on a dozen design guideline type projects, and I have two of them right now you could remotely call form-based codes. And everything else is a hybrid. And so when you start to talk about giving direction uh, for infill development and other things, you have this at one end of the scale, you have context-based design review, the other prescriptive standards, and, there's, and it takes a very different understanding. So we can just be brain dead and let the attorneys do the zoning, and we'll end up with a cookie-cutter result. And, uh, or we can start really thinking about context in communities in terms of how that starts to happen. And context, putting it in context, I hope you start every project that you work on in every studio by talking about that. So on the charrette last week, they had to go out and look at context. They had to do as-builts for the building. And that's how they spent the first four hours. And, uh, and so let's think about context. So quite often, your clients are going to hand you a project. You're going to go, okay, here's the site, and this is what it looks like today. And, and the city or the county, or whatever, they're going to review the project. Does it meet the standards? Does it fit the site or the setback is right? And never are you going to talk about what happens outside the lot line. All right? It will make you nuts. And so this is one of the things that we, so we have a historic context. We have culture resources, future context, current context. Past, current, future, but community scale, district context, you have to stand back. Any design direction you give anybody has to be based on understanding context and those sort of those three three uh, scales. And so also the review process needs to be clear, predictable, and fair. And I'm not, this, this is a two-day seminar, this one slide, and I'm not going to go there uh, at this point. But it's really part of a whole development review system in terms of land use planning, zoning, and everything else. So the type of directions you're providing. So for those of you who are currently working on form-based codes or other types of guidelines, Stand back and look at the existing planning and review system. To implement this, is going to be, is going to, it will take another set of directions. Contrast. I've just completed design guidelines for Sacramento County in California. The first county in California to have a design review system. And this was wholly a left brain zoning model. What they are doing now is that if you can prove that you're meeting the design guidelines, you don't have to follow zoning. Completely swung to the other side 
of the discussion in a context-based system. Because no zoning can ever anticipate all the conditions you're going to have. And you can't come up with 500 typical conditions in a strict form-based prescriptive, uh, pre prescriptive system. You need to think about the context within that. And so, uh, and so it's a cultural question in every community that we're working in. And to have a realistic system, we need to think about that. So for those of you who are working on, on transit-oriented development this year, this is a very important assignment you have as a college. And it's a very timely and exciting time to be in the College of Architecture and Planning as students, because this is going to be something that you're going to be able to track on this. And so when I shot that picture of downtown Sacramento in 1984 and the picture seven years later, that's the type of opportunity you're going to have at early part of your career by living and working in central Indiana for those who are going to stay. And, but here's some rules of thumb when you're doing your planning. Okay? So I have three rules. I do everything in groups of three because I need the other two brain cells to run the heart and lungs. So three rules. Seek solutions that can be incrementally developed. All right? I think high-speed rail in California is, is crazy. They're going to spend billions and billions of dollars to build a piece of infrastructure that will be open in 2020 that, will, is, that I'm sure will be a great terrorism target. And so they're putting all, instead of having a diversified incrementally development and inter, uh, develop transportation system that can start working next year to provide a compact armature for, for growth in California. We're going to wait for 20 years until Central Valley is just one big smog pit. You know? and, and so you got to get on it and think about how it's going to be incrementally developed. Use transit to direct growth, not react to it. All right? If you want to end up with some of these, these development pro program numbers I was talking about, you have to use it for that. And that, this is really important. And so if you work on the spaces between the buildings, so if you're a landscape architect, you're an urban designer, you know, every trip begins and ends as a pedestrian. And so uh, we're working up in the Tahoe Basin on a regional plan, and people oh, we want light rail. And a, uh, a transit guru visited them a few years ago, and he said, well, perhaps first you would want sidewalks. OK? So every trip begins and ends as a pedestrian. You have to think regional. You have to think about interstate commerce. These rails, freight moves on that. Indianapolis has always been a huge hub. Warehousing and distribution is a disproportionate amount of the employment in Indianapolis, more than almost any other city in the country. So we still have to move. There's a lot of trucks and freight that move through there. And so you have to have this attitude about those inter-regional discussions in freight versus folks. And one of the students today was saying, oh yeah, I couldn't wait to be able to take a train to Chicago. Think outside the region in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. Think at the metropolitan scale. This is this metroplex concept of thinking about Indianapolis as a large region. So Indy was one of the first places in the country that did UNIGOV, which is a city-county form of government. They're already starting to step back and think as a more of a metropolitan region. Expand that thinking. Think about the infrastructure. Think about the planning. Think about the commute sheds, just like watersheds, commute sheds. And how do you finance that? And that locally, every one of these communities, when you do your, your, your transit-based solutions, think about the right-of-ways that you need to secure now at a local level to support transit. Because they're not coming back. Rails to trails to rails. Okay? Think about what's, what you've got and what's coming back. Make the walking density uh, uh, connection with transit. And think about the jobs housing balance within communities. The ability to create a hot rocking neighborhood south of the train station in Indianapolis so all those knowledge workers could actually down there that work in the pharmaceutical companies Hopefully there'll be more than one in the future. You know, they should be able to walk to work instead of live on, go to work in Dresden. You know, in terms of what downtown looks like now. So these are the, these are Bruce's rules. And so, 
this is something that you need to be thinking about when you start, when you work this year uh, on your projects. Where does the future come from? Back up. Think about community values. We're going uphill in terms of our community values. It's a minivan SUV culture. We, nowhere else in the country has that been so quickly embraced as central Indiana. Nowhere else. And so that's an issue that needs to be gripped. So the green line, if this is going to be your pilot program and your case study, how do you start to think about demonstrating the benefits from that? And how do you implement it? We've got to get real. If we're a true partner in the implementation, the system uh, going forward, and that I would hope at the end of every semester you're working on a project that's related to this, that your last, your first and last day is talking about what do we need to do to be successful. What were the factors for success in terms of our planning or design assignment? And at the end, do we, are we going to change those? And did we follow those? Do we, can we reward our own good behavior? So that concludes my presentation for the evening. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. There's something else you'd like to talk about. Yes. So the question is, what do we think about implementing an urban growth boundary in Indianapolis? Well, were you on the Portland trip? OK, so that's where it came from, huh? Yeah, and so uh, I have a couple communities I work with that have urban boundaries. So the city of Napa, in spite of being in the Bay Area region, they have not changed their boundaries since 1976. No such thing as a new subdivision. Everything is infill, all right? They know their economy is connected to the, to the vines. They won't even allow an addition off the house that is going to encroach into, into the setback from agriculture. They are clear on what's the base of their economy and how they're going to, on how they're going to support it. So they've made the connection. Okay? And so they have in Portland, they've made the connection in many respects. Uh, and if you've been to the wine country up there, it is beautiful. And so it's a state, they've had some statewide policies about that. There's been some pushback on it, but it's still really important. You need to think about that. Maryland, everybody likes to talk about Maryland. Maryland's got a statewide plan. Scotland has got a national plan for, they have like the minister of waste reduction. I mean, they, I mean some people are really on a regenerative planning model. They're on it. We're not. Do you imagine in the Bush cabinet? The sustainability czar, that would be something. I'm waiting for that. OK, so other people are on it, all right? So any other questions? All right, thanks for having me. See you later.